Welcome to Weasel Jaw Digital. And today we're going to be taking a look at the A Wing in regards to dogfighting in particular. I covered a general overview of the A Wing and, and how, you know, some different builds and whatnot. Um, this video is strictly about dogfighting. Uh, I've been doing a lot of dogfighting. I really think I have it honed in on how to use these intercept ships really good. And this A-Wing is one of my favorites. I really love it. So we'll break down all the different categories, give you the, the highs and lows. Um, and, and to start with, I want to say that there's really two super effective A-Wing builds. One is a defensive strafing A-Wing that makes quick passes across the battlefield, picking out a target, hammering it quick, flying off again. You're not in for long exchanges. You're making quick passes, hitting something, breaking away from the combat. Those pilots, those ships tend to have lower deaths, but they also have lower kills. They're getting in and out of the action quickly. They're doing some damage. They're helping out in the battle. They're getting some kills against some, some prime targets. Um, but they're usually not racking up huge kills. I find those pilots, if they're good, to be by far the most annoying pilots I can face. Because I can never home in on them to knock them out. They're always flying full speed. They're in and out of the battle quick. Um, I had one guy in a battle that, that pounced and killed on me. Pounced on me and killed me six times in one battle. And I could never line up a shot on him. The other build is the brawling dogfighting build, and that's the one I prefer to go with. So we'll be talking about both. I'll be pointing out what's really good build for one versus the other. So it just kind of depends on your play style. As far as I'm concerned, though, the A-Wing is the best ship in dogfights, hands down. So we'll start by looking at our primary weapon. There are four choices. Um, we'll start by knocking out this ion cannon right away. The ion cannon is not a good weapon for dogfights. Um, sure, it can shut down ships, but it struggles to kill ships. You're not going to be able to spend a lot of time honing in on one single target um, and trying to kill something after it's ioned with these ion cannons takes too long. If you're working with a team of five players, Having one player with ion cannons is, is pretty good. You can depend on your other teammates to knock them out. But in a random group of five players, you cannot depend on your, your teammates to have your back and finish off those targets. You're going to be you know, knocking things out with the ion. No one's going to finish it off. It's going to restart and be a problem for you. So I would stay away from that. Next up in the most likely you want to pass it category is the Plasburst Laser Cannon. Very high DPS, and if you have your weapons charged to full, this thing can knock out interceptors in one shot. Downside is twofold. One, it's got limited range of only 600 meters. Now, honestly, for this weapon, you have to be super accurate, so your chances are you're going to be within 500 meters anyway when you're trying to use this weapon. So that's not a huge downfall, but you don't want to depend on this for longer range engagements. The other downside is you do have to charge it. It takes just a little bit of time where you got to hold that trigger, charge that attack before you use it. Um, and that often means that you're missing potential shots. Um, or when you charge it and you miss that shot, now you have to charge a new shot. And I find it's not a great weapon because of that. If you have a really steady hand, if you can really line up your shots, if you really like getting in close, this Plasburst laser cannon can be amazingly effective and you can do a lot of damage and knock out a lot of targets. I find, however, its downsides outweigh its positives. And I rarely see really good players using this and even when I do they aren't topping the charts 
they can be competent with this weapon, but they're never going to be as effective as they can with the other two weapons that we're going to be looking at. Next up, we'll look at the standard laser cannon. Not really high DPS, but not too low. Uh, good ammo capacity. You can shoot this thing for a long time, even when you don't have it set as your primary, as, as weapons as your primary power source. So this is the weapon that's often used by those strafing pilots. Because you can keep your power to engines, strafe in, line up targets, get some shots on them, and then still have that engine power to burst out of there and avoid return fire. It also has a thousand meter range, which gives it some advantages over the other A-Wing weapons. Um, in a case of this standard laser versus is the rapid fire cannon in a jousting situation where the two ships are coming at each other head to head, this standard laser cannon is going to knock out the rapid fire cannon every time because it can start doing damage 400 meters earlier. Even though the DPS isn't as high, it's going to win in those jousts. The strafing pilots can make great use of this. You can get damage on the target earlier. You can joust with other A-Wings and win. Um, and you have good long fire range even when you're keeping all your energy to your, your thrusters instead of your weapons. So it's a good weapon. It's not the one I use, but I don't do that style of play. That style of play is great for getting some kills and staying alive all game. Your kill-to-death ratio is going to be very high because you're very defensive setup um, but it is a very effective setup and it often can be extremely effective against the dogfighting a-wings so my choice of weapons like is the rapid fire cannon this thing has higher dps than the standard cannon lower than your other options but um, ammo capacity is really low range is is capped at 600 meters um, so, you know, there are some downsides. However, I find in dogfights, I tend to be really up close and personal anyways. Um, really the only battlefield where, where those long jousts tend to happen a lot is Esselus. Even in Yavin 4, there tends to be just kind of a big group, a big ball of fighters in one location. In the Esselus, though... You have people coming over that, that space station, fighting from long range. There's a lot of jousting situations. So this weapon struggles a little bit there. But in most of the other battlefields, you're fighting up close and personal anyways. So that loss of 400 meters and the fact that you're really not all that accurate out at that long range unless you're head-on-head -head jousting means that this is a great weapon. The thing is, you pretty much have to keep your power set strictly to weapons to be able to use this. If you have your power set to engines, you can only fire this weapon for really two seconds, which is not going to be enough to knock anything out. You're not going to be able to keep enough damage on that target to knock them out. So you only have short bursts. If you keep your, your energy all to weapons, you can actually keep this gun firing for long enough to knock out most things except for bombers. Bombers have a huge amount of health, and so it often takes several bursts plus some missiles to take them down. But for anything else, you can chew through them if you keep your energy set to weapons. So that's your dog fighting weapon. Your strafe weapon is the standard cannon. We're going to skip auxiliary. We're going to come back to that stuff in a little bit. We're going to talk about countermeasures next. The default is the Seeker Warhead, and honestly, in my opinion, it's the best all-around countermeasure that you have. We'll come back to it a little bit. Particle Burst is not a big favorite of mine. Um, it lets out just a chaff of particles that take up an area. They block any missiles coming through that area. They work against mines, too. Cooldown is only 9 seconds. You only have 3 uses. And the cloud only stays there for 3 seconds. 
it's good against mines. Um, it's okay against missiles as long as those missiles are coming in from behind you and not from the sides, top and bottom, or the front. Because then that chaff particle cloud isn't going to do you any good to protect you. So I find it's really not a very useful defensive measure. The sensor jammer has a four second duration, 26 second cooldown, but only one use. And that's the biggest downfall is that one use. All locked on missiles will lose you as a target and no one can target you for those four seconds. So if you have a lot of incoming missiles, you can trigger this. They all lose their tracking and no one can, can home in on you for another four seconds. That's nice but it has such limited use with that ammo capacity of one unless you have a dedicated person to you know restock that for you i find that this weapon's just too limited the carbanti sensor inverter is pretty useful if you're going a really strong anti-lock build um, otherwise i find the long cooldown and the limited ammo capacity not all that useful. On top of that, anytime someone has used this against me, I've been able to use my own countermeasures against the missile they're turning back on me. Sure, it sucks that I'm not getting that missile to hit the target. Um, and sure, it sucks that I'm having to use that countermeasure. But it's never once been a threat to me or done any damage to me. So I don't find it as a threat, which means I think other people would have the same issue. They're not going to find it as a big threat either. Um, the area of effect is very small also. So when you use it, that missile has to be almost right on top of you. And that often means that the enemy that shot the missile is quite a bit further away and has more time to react to it. So that really leaves just the Seeker Warheads. They have a range of 750 meters, so you can't use it at 1,000 meters. you got to let that missile get a little bit closer, wait for one of the little red... Um, Chirons to uh, activate, then you can go ahead and fire this off. Um, any closer is fine too. It does fire off two little homing missiles, so it can actually take out two enemy missiles. Has a cooldown of only 12 seconds, so it's fairly fast. Has an ammo capacity of four, which is the highest ammo capacity in our countermeasures. Cooldown's decent enough. The fact that it can shoot down two missiles at a time is good. Keep in mind that you can use this against mines that are within that 750 meters even before they have activated or are tracking you. So these are a great way to clear out those mines. I really want more people to know about that because I hate mines and there's really easy ways to deal with them. And this is one of those easy ways. If I hear someone drop a mine, if I hear that mine indicating sound, I'm popping a Seeker Warhead right away just to take that thing out. So those Seeker Warheads are probably going to be your choice for countermeasures 90% of the time. On to Hull. There is really only one good choice here. Um, there's, of course, our standard income ferroceramic hull. No bonuses or drawbacks. It's just standard hull. There is the Reflect Hull. This has a stealth range built in, just a passive stealth. Um, at long range, you can't be targeted. But that's a really long range. I find it pretty useless. Uh, most dogfighting happens within that range, um, so it's not that great. The loss of health really hurts too. Um, you don't have a lot of health with the A-Wing to begin with. Losing 30% of it kind of sucks. Just to get a, a minor passive stealth, that's really only going to help you like when you spawn or right in the first exchange, and only slightly. The lam Lamina Steel Hull would be a good choice if it was the other way around. Um, what this one does is it reduces auxiliary damage, so missiles and stuff. Um, but it increases primary damage. 
it's fairly easy to get rid of missiles to either dodge them, you know, evade them, or use countermeasures. So lowering the damage you're getting from those missiles, eh, it's not a big deal. Most of your damage is going to be coming from direct blaster fire, and in this case, we're increasing that. So this really doesn't help us at all. It's not a good choice for the A-Wing, for either build. The Dampener Hull, however, is a very interesting choice. It slows the lock time of enemy missiles by 100%. Now, that means your, your standard missile on the TIE Fighter or X-Wing that has a 2 second lock time, this is going to increase it to a 4 second lock time. And in these dogfights, that really helps. I can actually notice the difference between someone that has one of these um, upgrades that slows lock times and I can really tell if someone's sporting both because even with your quick fire missiles on this thing um, if they're sporting both it's going to take a long time to lock onto them so this is great and I know that because I hate it when the enemy is using this um, I'd much rather have people with a regular hull that I can do damage to now you do have to give up 10% of your health for this, but you only have 500 health to begin with, so you're only losing 50 health, which is not very much. Um, if you include your shields, you still have 950 total kind of health. Um, you have ways to regenerate both your health and your shields. So that little bit of lost health is not a gigantic deal for me. Um, I would suggest that Fabritech dampener hull on every A-Wing build. Absolutely. Next up is our shields. There is, of course, the standard shields. There are the nimble deflectors. This increases your shield regeneration by 100%, um, but lowers your max shields by 30%, and that hurts. You're going to lose 150 points of your shields, um, and you're going to regen shields a little bit quicker. Thing is, if you have time to regen your shields, you typically have time to regen your shields. I'm never in a situation where, like, a, the little half a second of regen I get before that I engage the next guy is really going to make a big difference to me. Um, so the, the quicker shield regeneration is not that valuable, and the loss of shields really hurts. The Overload Shield is another one that I kind of hate. Um, I do use it in one particular build. I have one A-Wing set up specifically to use this. Um, I use it in both dogfighting and in um, fleet battles. But what this upgrade does is it starts your shields as overloaded. It reduces your primary damage taken, and it reduces your auxiliary damage taken. So you're going to take less damage from blasters, you're going to take less damage from missiles. And a considerable amount less damage. However, your shield regenerate rate is lowered by 75%, which means you are going to struggle to regen those shields. And if your shields are depleted, you don't get to regen them at all. Now that's usually not a huge factor, but the significantly slower regeneration sucks. This is a potential. I would say you really need to try it out and feel it and, and pay attention to it and see how you like it. The reduced damage is nice. The loss of shield regeneration can be overcome a bit, by just remembering to power to your shields every chance you get and rebuild those shields and making sure you don't allow yourself to get totally depleted. This is a really good option for the strafer. Because that strafer is going to come in your, your defensive build. You, you hit quick, you get out fast. The reduction in damage is nice. And when you're making those wide arcs to come back in for another strafing run, you have time to regen your shields by putting power to shields. 
So if you're into that really defensive strafing build, overloaded shields are not bad. Now I don't do the strafing build, so where do I use this? I use this as a suicidal bomber in fleet battles um, because of the damage reduction and because I'm going to be dying anyway, so I'm not looking to regen those shields at any point. This is when I, I take this in with all my missiles and just try to take out components. Um, in dogfights, I use this in one specific match at one specific time. I will start Yavin matches with an A-Wing that has the overloaded shields and has both of the barrage rockets, the ion and the damage ones. You start so close in Yavin that you don't have time to overcharge your shields. So this starting your shields as overcharge is nice. It also reduces the damage you're going to take in that first exchange. And I'm just going to launch a bunch of rockets anyways. Um, so I'm not worried about really sticking in that fight for very long that, in that first exchange. So this overloaded shield does play a, a little bit of help for me in that Yavin scenario. Otherwise, the two big ones are just your standard or your Fabrotech Scrambler shield. Now, your Fabrotech Scrambler shield um, increases hostile lock time by 200% which is huge. Um, that means, you know, if, if something's got a two second lock, um, you're going to bump that up to a six second lock. If you couple this with your, your, uh, hull also, you can bump, you can bump a two second lock time up to eight seconds. Even on a, you know, the, the quick fire missiles that have a 1.3 second lock, um, you know, you're looking at over a five second lock time then. As someone that uses a quick lock missiles a lot, I can tell when someone has both of these equipped. Because five seconds in a dogfight is an eternity. And on those maps with lots of debris, um, I just can't get a lock. That person is going to dodge me. They're going to hide behind a rock. They're going to get behind some debris. I'm going to lose that line of sight, and I'm going to lose that lock. So there is some advantage to this. However, the one big problem is your shield regeneration delay is reduced. Shield regeneration delay is three seconds, or in this case, is going to be like six seconds. Um, so this really hurts that regen. Um, you know, it, it's, it's trade-off. I typically don't use it. Again, if you're using the strafer, this isn't a bad shield option for you. It's going to be a lot harder for anyone to launch missiles at you. For me, though, I use just a standard deflector shield. No bells or whistles. It works, it's fine, I can kick power to it when I need to. For our engines, we of course have our standard Incom Sudlight. We have the thrust engine. This engine increases your speed, but lowers your acceleration and maneuverability. It sounds like this would really appeal to your strafers, However, that loss of acceleration and the loss of maneuverability is, it kind of hurts you there. Because when you're making those strafing runs, you have to adjust where your ship is going to fall in behind an enemy ship. If you can't turn as sharp as them, you're not going to be able to get that target. You're not going to be as effective. So I would say definitely try it out before you use it to see if you really like it or not. The Quad X Propulsion Engine increases acceleration by a huge portion, but lures, but lures, lowers your maneuverability by 10%. Now that's not a huge loss of maneuverability. It's actually something you can work with. The increase in acceleration is incredible though. And if you are really great with handling your engine power, um, your speed, you can actually overcome that maneuverability loss 
really, really easy. You can, and I'll explain this a little bit, I guess, later when I talk about another one of the engines. We'll come back to this, I guess. Um, and that's this micro th thrust engine. This is my default. This is the one I go with a lot of the times. Um, if you're playing a strafer, not a good option for you. But if you're a dogfighter, this is a great option for you. It increases your maneuverability by 30%, making it an extremely maneuverable ship. To show you the stats on that, you can see here that our maneuverability is up to a 104 because we added 24 to that. That is the most maneuverability you can get. And it is impressive. To put it into perspective, the microthrust engine on the A-Wing means that if you just cut to 50% speed and you turn, you can actually turn faster than someone can do a drift turn. Those drift turns beat out almost all other turning situations, but the micro thrust engine on the A-Wing can actually turn faster than a drift turn. So if you're jousting with someone and they drift turn to try to get behind you, just by cutting your engine to 50% and turning around, you're going to be able to get them lined up for a shot before they can get you lined up for a shot. And that can really throw them for a loop. So this micro thrust engine is great. Now you do sacrifice a considerable amount of acceleration and speed and that is a bit of a problem um, but it's not that big of a deal you can overcome it acceleration you kind of I mean you notice it you feel it but there's not a lot of times when I really need to accelerate or decelerate right away and because you're lowered max speed anyways the lower Acceleration and deceleration isn't felt as harshly as if you could still go max speed. The reduction of max speed does kind of suck. Um, it's going to take you a little bit longer to get to the battle. So you're almost always going to need to do a boost early on just to get back to where the action is. It's going to take you a little bit longer to get back in there and engage the enemy. Um, it also means it's really easy for people to escape. So if you don't knock someone out right away and they're able to throw on a boost or just get up to max speed, um, you're going to be hurting to follow them. That loss of speed drops you down to a 112, which, you know, your X-Wings and TIE Fighters are faster than that. In fact, your Y-Wings sitting at a 110 are comparable speed to you at your 112. So you're going to be flying at like a Y-wing speed, which kind of sucks. Um, but I've learned to live with it. The, the big way that you, you deal with that is by using some boost when you need to. But most of the time you're getting into that action. You're getting into that, that ball of combat and you're just being able to whip around and get behind them and line up targets. You don't need to be flying off somewhere. In fact, you often don't want to be flying off towards an enemy because then you're risking a situation where you're jousting with them. And almost everybody is going to be able to beat you in a joust with the A-Wing. So not what I recommend doing. So that's a really nice option. Now, the reason I wanted to come back to this propulsion engine is, strangely enough, it can turn around almost as fast as the microthrust engine. It can, it can also turn around on this A-Wing faster than a drift turn can. The reason that happens is because you can so quickly drop yourself to 50% speed, turn and crank that speed back up, that you can just make real quick turns. Um, a drift turn takes just about three seconds to, comp to complete a 180. Um... The micro thrust can do it just at two seconds. This can do it just a hair over two seconds. And that can be pretty nice. And you only lose 10% maneuverability. Now that is a little bit of maneuverability, but you still stay pretty maneuverable compared to your other ships. You got a 72 
whereas the X wing's at a 75, your Y wing is at a 70. So you're still eking out an advantage over them, uh, maneuverability wise, um, but it's not a huge advantage. So that's why I stay away from it. I want that maneuverability. That's what I'm really honing in on. So, you know, again, for, for strafers, the thrust engine isn't bad, but it's got some downsides. Um, the propulsion engines may be okay. For dogfighters, you really should be going with the micro thrust or maybe the propulsion engine. Uh, for your strafers, the standard engines aren't bad. I love the micro thrust though. Um, the other nice part with the micro thrust is you drop that speed down to 50%. You can beat anybody in a turning battle. So those those tail chasing ones where you you are in a kind of a, a an orbit with someone else. Um, if you have this micro thrust engine and you drop your speed to 50%, you're going to be able to cut that corner closer, and you're going to be able to start lining up shots with them. At that point, they have one of two things. They can either keep trying to spiral you and you'll slowly kill them as you line them up for shots, or they keep doing that and hope someone comes and save them, or they break off, at which point you can follow them, get on their tail, and wipe them out. So this is the prime choice when it comes to dogfighting. Um, if you're a strafer, I'd probably go with the sublights, but you can try the other engines too. So now we're going to be talking about our auxiliary weapons. And there are some really good choices here. If you have nothing else to go with, if you're not sure what to pick, the repair kit is always a really nice system. Um, it heals your hull damage. And it heals it at 36 health per second for 8 seconds, which is a total healing health of 288 health. Um, you have a ship that's going to be running 450 to 500 health, so that's more than half. Um, it's a nice way to boost that health back up. It slowly regenerates and doesn't have any max usage, uh, so it's a 30 second cooldown. It's, it's a great thing to have. I equip it standard on all my A-wings. In fact, Anything I have that can use a repair kit is going to get the repair kit. Next up, um, we'll talk about some of our other systems before we get to the ones I really like. The targeting jammer is amazing. I don't use it. I don't like using it. But it is amazingly effective. It is one of the most annoying things I fight against. So if there's someone out there that's using this against me, I get frustrated. Um, this is one of the few things that really frustrates me. For, for five seconds, they can't lock on you. You're invisible from their radar. They can't lock on you. They can't shoot missiles at you. Um, and you wouldn't believe how much harder it is to aim and fire and hit someone that's using this. The amount of information you get from that little target lock square around a target is way more than you think it is. One, it helps you visualize where they're going to if you're trying to chase them or when they're flying across your screen really fast. Secondly, it allows you to get your lock. Third, though, it acts as a range sensor, and I have adapted to that. I depend on that range sensing, basically how big that square is compared to the ship, to be able to lead effectively and hit the target ship. When they use this targeting jammer and I don't have that guide, I almost can never lead and hit them. I just can't do it. Um, I'm just not capable of it. So that targeting jammer is extremely effective. I've seen people use that when they're coming in on that first pass at the beginning of the match, and it's effective. People can't get locks on them. People can't hit them. They can swoop in behind people and get some kills. I've seen it mid-battle, uh, people coming in and using it. 
it's a great tool for strafers. If you're a strafe pilot, um, I would probably use this over the repair kit. Uh, the reason is you come in, you line up your shot. If anybody shoots at you, you can hit this and fly away. It's a great way to escape a situation and not get killed. Next up is our ion rockets. Um, these do 300 ion damage, considerably less actual damage to ships. Um, they fire incredibly fast. It's a cooldown of 0.2 seconds. So in one second, you're going to fire five, they say 5.9 shots a second. So you can get almost six of these off every second. You only have 30 of them. They're dumb fired, so you don't lock with them. They do have a range of a thousand meters. Um, because they're dumb fired, I don't find these to be very useful. If you get directly behind a target, sure, you can hit them with these and do some damage. Um, you can hit them with the ions, you can shut their ship down and, and whatnot. And it works. But so often you're not right behind a target or just jousting a target. And in those situations where there's any kind of a, an angle between you and the ship you're fighting, you're not going to be able to line these up. And any little movement by then means you miss anyways. So I don't find these to be very useful. Same problem with the barrage rockets, which are the same kind of thing. Um, these fire four shots per second, same thousand meter range. These travel twice as fast as the ion version. These also have more ammo at 40. Um, the damage to hull is 100, where this does 300 to shields and less to um, the hull. There are two specific times that I use these. Um, one in fleet battles as my suicide bomber, um, where I'm just going and making a suicidal pass at capital ship um, targets. The other time I'll use this is with my crazy Yavin starter build. The one where I'm using the overpowered shields. I will equip both the ion rockets and the barrage rockets. The reason for this is in those situations, um, you have five ships spawning on both sides and they just kind of both fly towards each other in one big mass. Once in a while, someone will be wise and break off. Um, but I find if I try to break off with an A-Wing, I'm then going to get targeted and I'm probably going to lose that exchange because I'm almost in a jousting situation there, uh, especially if I get attention from more than one fighter. So what I have found is if I overload the shields and you don't have time to do that manually, so that's why I take the overload shields, fly straight into the middle with those overloaded shields, the damage reduction you're getting from the overloaded shields, and then just fire off the barrage rockets and the uh, ion rockets. You can actually disable a lot of ships, do a lot of damage, and, and get a good early lead for your team. You're disabling ships, you're damaging ships, you might knock out a couple ships. That gives your team a chance to get that early initial victory on, um, on Yavin, um, which is a really interesting open map. So you really need to get that kind of territorial control to, to get ahead. Um, the one time I would say don't do that on Yavin is if you're facing me. I just don't. It's my plan. Let me have it. I like it. It's crazy. It's it's effective, but after that initial exchange, you're, you're going to miss having actual lock-on rockets. <laughs> Because um, you're going to have all these dumb fire weapons that you can just kind of like flail out there, but they're not going to do anything. Uh, but for that initial exchange, it's kind of fun and kind of funny. Next up is the cluster missile. This is an interesting weapon that I don't really care for. Um, the, uh, the cluster missiles do 450 damage each. So firing off all four of these is a huge chunk of damage. You're going to be able to take out, you know, your interceptor class ships with just two of the missiles. You're going to be able to take out, you know, your A-wings possibly, um, 
if they if they have some damage, your support ships and X wings are going to be falling at around three to four of these missiles. So really effective, um, high damage. The problem is the lock on time. To lock one of these on is only eight seconds, nice and quick. But if you want to get more locked on, it takes 0.8 seconds per lock. That means to get all four locked on, you're looking at 3.2 seconds. In dogfights, that's a long time. If they have a way to slow those lock-ons, either through hulls or shields, you could be looking at way, way longer to get those additional missiles locked. And that's a problem. Now, you only have five shots with this, which isn't bad, but not great. The big downfall here is the 12-second cooldown. In a dogfight, I want to be firing off missiles a lot more frequently than every 12 seconds. Uh, missiles are a great way to augment your damage. They're a great, great way to hit things that are maybe escaping from your range. 12-second um, wait on that kind of sucks. Now, for a strafer... It's a nice weapon to use. You're coming in from a long ways away. You're setting up a good approach angle. You can get those lock-ons from a thousand meters away. Maybe get one or two of them and hit that fire, that trigger. Um, hit them with your longer range weapons. And then again, you're going to burst away to safety. So for your strafers, this cluster missile is a nice option. For dogfighters... I would stay away from it. That cooldown is really going to hurt you. Next, we'll talk about the quick lock missile. This is my favorite. This is my, my go-to with the repairs. I go repair kit. I go quick lock missile. 1.3 second lock on time is pretty good. Four second cooldown is brilliant. You can get a lot of these things fired off. You have eight shots with them too. That's really nice. Damage is on the weaker side. It's only 375 damage. So you're not you're not using this to knock out ships. You're using this to augment your damage. So while you're shooting at a bomber, you're augmenting your blasters with some quick lock missiles. You're you're getting someone locked, you're getting some some damage on them, and as they jet away, you're firing that quick lock missile. So that's where it's useful. Um, I love these. I use these all the time. It is my favorite go-to weapon. Um, the only downside with that quick cooldown, with that quick lock-on, ammo capacity of 8, is you're really going to, if, if you're a good pilot and you can stay alive long enough, you're going to run out of ammo and you're going to miss them really bad. One thing I'd like to point out too about this cluster missile, they're only medium homing. Um, whereas your quick lock missiles are strong homing. That strong homing means that they travel faster and they can, they're, they're harder to evade. So they'll stay on a target as they make maneuvers a lot better. So that's the other reason I really like these quick lock missiles. Now the last one, I'm, I'm ashamed to even suggest it because I really hate the fact that these are in the game. I think they need to be heavily, heavily nerfed um, but it's the Seeker Mine. They do great damage. Um, 900 damage is enough to knock out a lot of Interceptor class ships. The lifespan of this is for 10 seconds. So you drop it, it sits there for 10 seconds. You have a 9 second cooldown. Arming range is 200 meters. So any ship that gets within that 200 meters arms those mines, and then they're going to seek out that target. They have strong homing, just like the quick lock missiles. Ammo capacity of 6, which is really high. So it's high damage, strong homing. They last a long time. The actual activation time, the arming time, is less than 3 seconds. I want to say it's right of around 2 seconds from what I've seen. So you can actually drop these just prior to making a pass by something. So you can just fly over them hit that mine a little bit in front of them or near them, and it's probably going to activate before they get outside of that range. You can do it um, in your, in your uh, jousting type situations. 
Um, anytime someone's on your tail, you can just drop one of these and they'll either have to break off, they'll have to adjust their aim and shoot it, or they'll have to use a countermeasure to take it out, um, or they're going to take 900 damage and possibly blow up from it. These things are way too effective. I don't have a problem with them. Like I said, you can shoot them, you can countermeasure them, and you can actually countermeasure them before they activate. So as soon as one is launched, if I hear that signal, I'm going to use my counter my, my countermeasures. I'm going to launch my seeker warheads at it. So, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the ways you can take them down because they really are easy to take down. You know, you shoot them, use your countermeasures. It's not a big deal. The other time you can use them to great effect is when you're in those tail chasing ones where you, you, engage with someone else and you're both kind of circling each other drop one of these things they're staying within that 200 meters within two seconds it activates it chases them it does an amazing amount of damage now again they can countermeasure it or they can break free and try to fly away from it um again i can handle these pretty well i don't die to mines all that often i do die to them occasionally um you don't see them in debris you don't hear that sound um, you don't have countermeasures you can use. Sometimes it just happens. But I see these wipe out rookie players all the time. And I've been in matches where three or four of the enemy is using these things. And they can just take over entire areas of the map by dropping these mines. And rookie players get blown up left and right. They're just overpowered for the average player out there. Um, but that does mean they're really, really effective. As a strafe player, they're pretty nice. You strafe in. If anyone gets on your tail, you can drop one of these. Um, if someone starts a tail chase with you, you can drop one of these. You can just joust with someone, drop one of these, let them finish them off. Um, so they can be really powerful. I just hate seeing them used. So... There's the equipment. We've talked about both the jousters, the, 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 the strafers. They're going to be making wide passes back and forth across the battlefield. And we've talked about those, those dogfighters. Again, my build, the build you see me using almost all the time, is going to be the rapid fire cannon, the repair kit, the quick lock missiles, seeker warheads. I'm going to go with that dampener hull to reduce lock on time. I'm going to go with standard shields and micro thrust engine. That's gonna give me the maneuverability. These are gonna help keep me alive along with that. That's gonna help me do damage with that up close. So there you go. That's the quick and dirty on dog fighting with the A-Wing. Um, I hope you found this guide useful. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.